off shotguns, but that was just over there, and it was more interesting what was going on over there with like 8,000 day glow people jumping up and down. So I went from like playing to 30 people to 8,000 within a couple of weeks. Some kid came up to me and said, you know, that track you played, well, the bass line changed my life. So I, I called um, one of my tracks, the bass line changed my life. And, um, and I called another track, Energy, after that party. I wouldn't credit myself with innovations. I mean, I was just a cog in the wheel, really. As the nation raved through another summer of love in 89, the police stepped up the pressure. We were getting up to 246 parties in the region a week. We'd have two of everything. We'd have two venues, two sound systems, two lighting crews, and if one didn't happen, we'd just go to another one. Simple as that. I then had to resort to tactics that probably were not totally legal, but were somewhat effective. The police were following us everywhere. They'd be following us, they'd be following all the people that worked for us, they'd be following the sound guys, they'd arrest the sound guys, the lighting guys. Tomorrow could see the beginning of the end of acid house parties. With the police seemingly powerless, in 1990, Tory MP Graham Bright entered the fray. Graham Bright, the MP for Luton South, is bringing in a private member's bill, which could result in organisers being jailed and their equipment seized. But making the parties illegal only attracted more criminals. Uh, I was kidnapped uh, uh, three times. Um, by three different groups. So, you know, I had shotguns in my mouth and, you know, which was very, very, very scary. You know, on, on that particular occasion, I got to admit, I cried my eyes out. <laughs> I think, in a way, we failed because we drove it underground. And when we drove it underground, there was far more dangers and there was far more thuggery and there was extortion. We're only trying to do some parties. And that's what I would say to them. You know, well, we're only trying to do some parties, man. You know, it's no big deal. I think there was a kind of unconscious reaction to the idea that Margaret, Th Margaret Thatcher had propagated that there is no society. And I think people created their own societies unwittingly in defiance of that statement. It's great to see how, how it kind of broke down all, all social barriers and but racial barriers as well in the sense of, you know, we wanted to dance to one kick drum and this is it, bang. During that time, it was when we named ourselves, it was when they used to be all those big London orbital raves where you'd drive around the sort of Potter's Bar service station, ringing up a secret number and finding out where the next rave was. And they were sort of marching around the M25 towards us until one appeared about two miles away from our front door, which was crap, actually. It was a crap party. <laughs> Absolute rubbish in a big cow tunnel. <laughs> Inspired by Chicago House, Detroit Techno and the M25 rave scene, Orbital's chime signalled Britain's total mastery of the new dance music. Yeah, I can turn that on and off and that brings that sound in and out. These are MMTHs, these are what we use live. They're basically little hardware sequencers. They work in a system of each machine has eight loops, eight different pieces of music if you like, that they're all loops round in time, but then each machine has a hundred of these groups of eight. This is all sort of going round, I might think, let's have some drums. And let's change the sequence at the same time. So I'll push that along. And there we are into another part of the song, you know. This is, this is going round, it's a different pattern now. Hence the different tune. Might do something like this, put the bass line in, take the drums out. And then sort of prepare myself for the something a bit bigger and bring all the drums back in. And there we go, shine in a, in a live fashion. So you pause, place that on there. It's got the sampler playing that. Now I've got the mixing desk, and you can then, you know, you can mess around with the, the sound. 
sort of played to Jazzy M, and he's, his eyes nearly popped out of his head. It was quite unique, and it was a unique sounding tune. It had all the kind of acidy twitterings in it, reverse strings. You know, Matt, it was just a great record, very, very original. And he was listening to it on headphones, and he was selling all these records on a Friday evening to all the DJs, and he said, look, I can't play it out loud, I've got to, you know, be selling people things. And he listened to them and went, hang on a minute, whipped his records off and played it, and just, like, stood there laughing, and all these people going, oh, I'll have one of them, oh, I'll have one of them, oh, yeah, I'll have one of them, and all these DJs asking for it, saying, you can't have it, it's a tape! The only way to actually cut that record was from that cassette. Which I did. But we, it actually we, we, came out slow because I recorded it on my dad's tape deck, which actually ran slightly fast, so it's actually like a couple of BPM slower than it was supposed to be. When we actually licensed it to Double F Double R, because Pete Tong uh, went after it um, to sign it up, to save kind of face and embarrassment, we actually we put the cassette onto a DAT, a digital audio tape, to actually then sell to him, so it wouldn't look too cheap. <laughs>